Hello, Facebook friends and family. Hi, Shelly. How are you? Good evening, everyone joining. I'm going to give you guys just a few minutes to um, come on before I get started because I know people are getting off of work and in transition and maybe they're getting in their cars or they're sitting in traffic or uh, trying to make dinner <laughs> or any of those good things. But I want to um, give a couple, give it a minute or two before people jump on um, so people can jump on before I get started. Yep. Please share the video if you guys don't mind. Share the video on your timeline. Uh, you might know somebody who needs it. Um, oftentimes we're going through valleys and going through seasons where we're going through things and facing difficulties and we don't always uh, share with people when we're going through these things. So you never know who on your timeline is going to be going through a valley soon or is in a valley or just came out the valley, <laughs> maybe going back to face the same valley because they didn't get what they needed out of the valley. Uh, they didn't get transformed. They didn't get conformed into the image of Christ. They didn't grow. They didn't handle the valley well and that sort of thing. So please share it if you can. I would appreciate it. Um, okay, so we're just going to let people uh, join in. hope everyone is having a great evening and getting ready for the snow that's coming. <laughs> So as you guys know, I have been talking a lot uh, recently about um, getting strategic battle plans from God um, during times that we are dealing with, um, you know, uh, disappointments, um, dealing with uh, facing things that we never thought that we would face, uh, landing in seasons that we didn't anticipate landing in, um, and that sort of thing. So I kind of really wanted to open up the discussion tonight and teach a little bit about uh, what God has taught me about being in the valley. Um, been through the valley a lot, and I know a lot of you have as well, and maybe some of you are in the valley right now. And what I mean by valley is just a place that, you know, um, a place of pruning, a place of refining, a place of a challenging place, a place that, you know, um, it's not a good not a good feeling place. It's a place that uh, stretches you. It's a place that conforms you. It's a place that grows you. And those things are often very uncomfortable <laughs> if we're honest and we're real. Hey, Sharita, how are you? Hey, Paul, how are you? Um, if you guys can, please share the video on your timeline because I do believe that there's a lot of people out there facing valleys and I believe that they need this tool to help them get through the valley. You know that we serve a very strategic God. God is strategic in everything that he does. You know, he doesn't just, uh, he hasn't just, you know, put everything together and, oh, well, we're going to see what happens in Regina's life. We're going to see what happens in Paul's life. We're going to see what happens in Shelly's life. We're going to see what happens in Sharita's life. That's not how God works. God is very strategic. He knows your end from the beginning, Scripture tells us, and that all of our days are numbered, and all the days are numbered. All the days are written out. Everything that we're going to do is already written out, and we have free will in that, but God is strategic. He already knows the downfalls. He already knows the pits we're going to face. He already knows uh, the, the depressing spots. He already knows the challenges. He already knows, um, you know, all the things that we're going to face in life, and he has provided us strategies and tools to help us through what we're going through and the things that we're going to face. And I believe what I have tonight is a, a tool for the kingdom. It's a tool for believers, people that would take this information, apply it to your life. If you do that, you're going to find yourself um, easing through the valleys. Okay. It doesn't mean that you're not ever going to face a valley again. What it means is that you're going to have the tools needed to successfully go through the valley, okay, because we all go through them. Sometimes we go through valleys back to back, back to back. Those are more like wilderness experiences where everything is just, you know, everything is being challenged around you. Um, those are more like wildernesses, but we do face valleys, things that we didn't anticipate, things with our health, things with our finances, things with our family, things with our businesses, our careers, things even with our faith walk in God. 
um, things even in, in ministry and even just going to church and being in church and being around other believers. There's all types of things that we that we go through and that we encounter. And God wants us to have successful tools to help us um on our journey okay so what I have tonight for you guys is a battle plan a strategic battle plan to help you through valleys so we're going to talk about the valleys I'm going to take questions at the end so if you guys have uh, questions you can I'll let you know when you can ask them so I, I can make sure that I see them um, so I'll let you know when that's when I'm ready to take questions and uh, that sort of thing and I kind of just want to get right into what I wanted to share with you, okay? Um, this is the hour God is really equipping the believer. So um, he's equipping us for everything that we need. We're not going to have any excuses uh, not to be equipped. God wants us to be skilled workers for him. He wants us to be, um, he wants us to be skilled. He wants us to know what we're doing. He wants us to have the tools of the kingdom. He wants us to know his way. He wants us to know his ways of doing things, his ways of maneuvering through things. He wants us to be overcomers, right? The word says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So we all have testimonies. Even the valleys that we go through creates a testimony for us, right? It creates a testimony. And at the same time, it also puts a righteous demand on the character of God and it proves who he is. All the things that he talks about, in scripture, how, how he uh, defines himself and, and shares how he, you know, his character with us. We come to know that. We come to know his character for real. We come to encounter his character in the valleys and also in other times. But tonight I'm really talking about valleys and disappointment in the valleys. So, okay, so we know that God is a God of strategy. And we know that he is strategic. We know that he wants to give us strategic battle plans. OK, so I want to talk about how we can convert our valleys into a fortified place of strength. OK, because we can't stop, you know, we can't stop the valley from coming to pass. We can't stop the encounter in the valley, but we can control our response in the valley. We can control um, how we view things in the valley. We can determine whether this valley is going to make us or whether this valley is going to break us, okay? So um, so God wants to give us that strategic battle plan to help us in the valley, okay? And I'm going to share those things with you. But the word convert means to cause to change in form, in character, or in function, okay? And we know that the valley isn't changing. So what is being converted in the valley? Your character is being converted in the valley, okay? Your substance, your form, your integrity, you know, everything about you is being changed in the valley if you allow it to happen. I know people that go through valleys, valley after valley, and they never get what they need out the valley. And why is that? Because the valley is there to conform you into the image of Christ. Okay, you can, you know, God can take you through, through those things just like the children uh, of Israel went through the wilderness for how long? They were out there for a real long time. Why? Because it took them that long to get it, right? It took them that long to get all the stuff worked out of their hearts because they didn't cooperate with the process of God. They didn't understand that God was taking them into this wilderness place in order to, um, in order to bring them into their promised land. You know, they looked at it as a very negative thing. And sometimes we look at our valleys as something negative. And I'm here to tell you that your valley is not negative. Okay. Your valley can be a fruitful, peaceful place. And that doesn't mean that your valley is void of, of <laughs> difficulties and challenges, but it, you can have joy, you can have peace, you can have righteousness, you can have all these things that are by you, it, 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 that, are, um, that are technically yours in the kingdom if you're a believer, you can have these things in the valley. You don't have to go through, woe is me, how am I gonna make it through this? Here comes another valley, well maybe, just maybe we need to change our view of the valley, okay? Because we know however we view a thing is determines our response to it. So if we see the valley or we see difficulties as a negative thing, our response is going to be negative. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, right? Okay, so uh, we're talking about converting your valley into a fortified place of strength. 
So how do we do that? We do that by writing out a strategic battle plan. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys uh, the tips that I've learned, <laughs> how I've learned to put together a battle plan. I've learned to put it together because I've been in the valley, been in a lot of valleys. I was in a wilderness season for many years where I encountered valley after valley, and I had to learn some things in that time, and I'm so grateful that I went through it. I'm so grateful that I learned. I'm so glad I got the strategy of God in those difficult places. And I believe that God wants me to share this with some people because I believe it's going to help you. I believe this is going to be a timeless tool for the kingdom that's going to help every believer that puts it into place. So I believe that to be so. I believe this video is going to reach across the world. Honestly, I do. I believe people in other countries are going to be able to view this tool and be able to, um, to use it and be fortified and come out of the valley and come out of the valley strengthened, to come out of the valley with wisdom and understanding and come out fortified and come out shining, come out refining like you've been in the fire. You've been refined of your impurities. You've been refined of the things that you couldn't take with you in the next place. Okay, so we're talking about getting the uh, strategic battle plan from God. A couple things about the battle plan I need you to know. Uh, before I give you all the points. A couple things I need you to know. Number one, I need you to know that you need to ask the Holy Spirit for a personalized strategic battle plan. That means everyone's battle plan may be a little different from someone else's, but there are some common, uh, common elements, I think, that belong in every battle plan, but I do think every battle plan is also going to be uh, a little different because it just depends on what you're facing and where the Lord is taking you. And we know that he has a plan and purpose for your life. And I hope everyone viewing this Facebook Live knows the plan and purpose for their life. I really do. If not, you need to ask the Lord for the purpose of your life. But uh, number one, you're going to ask the Holy Spirit for a personalized strategic battle plan. Why do we need a battle plan? Because wars are won by strategy. OK, the United States military doesn't just go into another country or or take part in a war with no battle plan and with no strategy. They don't just walk in and say, oh, let's see how this goes. Sometimes we're like that in the valley. Oh, let's just see how this goes. I'm just going to ride it out. No, you don't need to ride it out. You need to get a strategic battle plan. Okay, there's no way you're going to win the plan if you don't know your destination in the valley. And we're going to get to that real soon about your destination in the valley because you need to know where you're going and why you're there. So uh, the second thing I need to know about the strategic battle plan is that you need to write it down. You are going to literally write down your battle plan. Um, you're going to write it down. You're going to make a note of it. Put it in the notes in your phone. Write it down someplace where you can actually put it on paper. That way you get all the thoughts out of your head and you have something you can read and look at. So you want to make sure you write it down. The next thing I need you to know about the battle plan is that it needs to be fluid. It needs to be fluid in the sense that it's going to change. It may not always be the same. It may not start out. It may not end the same way that it starts out. You may start out with one battle plan, and depending on how long your valley is, you know, you may, um, you know, you may change midstream because the strategy is changing, uh, or what needs to happen you're, is changing, or you're getting more information and you're getting understanding because we know understanding is a wellspring of life to those that have it. So part of being in the valley is definitely getting understanding, but you need to write down your battle plan, okay? You need to make sure that it's fluid, that you allow it to be fluid, and you allow it to change as the Lord leads you to change it, okay? And then I need you to ask yourself a couple things um, about this battle plan, okay? And I need you to, to be really real with yourselves, okay? I need you to ask yourself this, this question here. What areas am I failing in? You need you need to get real real with yourself. Is that does that make is that's probably not good English. You need to get real real with yourself. You need to get real with yourself so you can target and strengthen the weak areas. It's important to identify any behaviors or responses that need to change because that's the purpose of the valley. The purpose of the valley is to bring you conform you into the image of Christ, to cause you to change in form, to be converted into something that you're not. When you go in, come on, when you go in the valley, you may look one way, but when you leave, you should look another way. And I'm not talking about 
physical. I'm talking about on the inside. Your stuff should be different on the inside. The stuff that you went in with, you shouldn't leave with. Okay, the obstacles that you had, you shouldn't leave with. The amount of faith that you had when you walked in the valley, you should walk out with more faith. All these things should change while you're in the valley. Okay, so you're asking yourself, what areas are you, are you failing in? What that really means is, in this valley, what areas are you missing it in? You know, how are you responding to it? Are you not in prayer? Are you not doing praise and worship? Are you not reading your Bible? Are you not talking to God? Have you given up? Are you grumbling and complaining? What, are, what, what areas do you know you need to change? And most people, when they ask themselves that question, they can answer it. So you know what areas you need to change, in, and the Lord is going to reveal it to you. The next thing I need you to ask yourself is, what area are you being attacked in? Are you being attacked in your faith? Are you being attacked in, comp in your confidence, in the confidence in yourself, or in the confidence of, in God? Are you being attacked in your value as a son or daughter of God? Is your marriage being attacked? Is your children or ministry being attacked? Okay. Um, you know, this would be the area that you need to focus on and fortify yourself in. So what is being attacked? Is your faith being attacked? You know, is the promises of God that he made to you two years ago being attacked? Is your business being attacked? What is it that's under attack? Okay, what is it, what thoughts are you having that you know are contrary to what God has said or what God has already written in his word? So you need to look at what areas you're being attacked in. That way you can um, have understanding of how to fortify yourself. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, so the following items are the items I believe that everyone needs in a battle plan. There is no ifs, ends, and buts about these items. These are items, these should be in every battle plan for every valley that you're in, okay? These are standard items I believe that the Lord has uh, taught me. He's taught me how to fight well. The Lord wants us to fight like warriors. So warriors has tools, right? We have tools. We, we have things in our hand. We have strategies. We have tools to get done what needs to get done. So a lot of times, you know, as believers, we're warriors. That's what we are. We, you know, we war. So we have to have tools. So these are the items that every uh, believer needs to have in their tool bag. Uh, when it comes to dealing with the 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 um, the valley, so okay, the first one you guys are gonna love this one. <laughs> the first one is repent. <laughs> repent for an incorrect attitude. Repent for rogue thoughts that went unchecked. And now you need to bring every thought into the obedience of Christ Jesus. So repenting is important. Why is that? Because you want to clear the slate. Okay, maybe you've been in the valley for two days, and maybe you've been in the valley for a couple months. Maybe you've been in a valley for a year or two years. I've had some valleys that lasted, my God, you know, five, six years. They weren't easy things to face. So I needed a strategy. It wasn't one of those things that just came and went overnight. That thing was here to stay. Not only was it here to stay, that thing was here to break me. Okay, that thing was here to demolish me. That thing was here to take everything I had, every ounce of faith I had, every promise I was standing on in the word of God. That thing was here to dismantle who I was and who I am and what I'm carrying. So some of the valleys, you know, are, are long valleys. You have to have a plan. So, okay, I think I'm getting off course. Okay, so, but anyway, we're talking about repenting. Okay, why are we doing that? Because you want to clear the slate. Okay, you want to acknowledge what hasn't been going going right. If you've been complaining, if your attitude has been bad, you know, whatever it is, you know yourself. So you know what you need to repent for. Repent. Okay, so you, the, the slate can be clean and we can start over in this valley. <clears throat> the next item is repent again. <laughs> repent and stop all grumbling and complaining. Okay, now you know, scripture tells us that that the words that come out of our mouth, that we're going to love those words and we're going to eat the fruit of those words, right? And that life and death is in the tongue. We know this. This is what scripture tells us. So you really need to repent and you need to 
Um, yeah, yeah, I hear the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you need to repent and stop all grumbling and complaining. And the other thing you need to do is you need to pull those words down. Any word or anything that you said out of your mouth that is contrary to the word of God, like, oh, I'm not, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. I don't think I'm going to make it through. I don't think my marriage is going to last through it. I don't think, you know, I don't, I just want to give up. I mean, whatever you said out of your mouth that is contrary to the will of God, you need to pull those, those words down. And you do that by repenting. Lord, I repent. Father, forgive me for not believing that you're going to sustain my marriage. I'm just going to use marriage as an example. Lord, I repent for, you know, for not wanting to love my wife or husband. I repent, Lord God. I pull every word down, spoken every word contrary to the will of God in my life, Father God. I call those words uh, voided, Father God. I thank you that those words have crop failure. They fall to the ground and die in Jesus' name. That's important because you're doing that to pull down everything that you've already been saying because we know that whatever we say out of our mouth is what's going to be created. God created the world by speaking it into existence. Let there be light. And what happened? There was light. So the same thing we're speaking. Oh, my husband's driving me crazy. My wife's driving me crazy. My kids are driving me crazy. These people I work with are driving me crazy. Whatever you're saying out of your mouth is producing fruit. And there's some people I know that's going to be watching this video right now. The Holy Spirit is convicting you because you don't like the work. <laughs> Yeah, you don't like the work environment that you're in. You don't like it. But part of the problem is your mouth. Part of the problem uh, uh, pro part of the problem is the things that you're confessing out of your mouth. You're making it worse. So if you're having a difficult time at work, you need to you need to repent for the words that you spoke in regarding your coworkers, your environment, how you feel about it. And if you do that and if you pull those words down and start to be conscious and start to speak the opposite of what you've been saying, stop the negative and speak the positive. I'm telling you, you're going to see a difference at work. So I don't know who that's for, but I know that's for somebody. So that's a sidetrack, but we're going to keep it moving. So the item we were just talking about was repenting and stopping all grumbling and complaining. And, you know, we're going to let the Holy Spirit just tune in wherever he wants to tune in. We want him to, to do that. We want him to guide us in this. I don't know everything. He hasn't shown me everything regarding this, and I believe he's still speaking and giving us understanding as we chew on this and break it down and take it in. So we want to leave room for the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants to do, even on this broadcast. So that's just a little side note. So, okay. So the next thing you need to do in for your strategic battle plan, this is another item that is just essential. OK, you need to ask the Lord, why are you in this valley and what do you need to learn from it? OK, you need to ask the Lord, how are you equipping me in this? You know, you're doing that to get understanding. Understanding is a wellspring of life to those that have it. So you want to make sure you're getting understanding. OK, often the area that you're being attacked in is the area that you're called to. You know, I, I'm going to share an experience with you. There was a time that I was really, um, really going through some valleys regarding finances and uh, quite a few valleys regarding finances, you know, because my heart has always been just to walk with God. I don't care about money. Anyone that knows me personally knows I could care less about money, <laughs> could care less about it. You know, but one of the areas that he's called me to is to be a kingdom finan financier. So, you know, this was an area that I had to go through valleys. This was an area that I had to be stripped in. This was a valley. This was areas that I had to go through in finances that, you know, that didn't make sense to a lot of people as I was walking through it. It, 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 it cost me something. I had to give up a career. I had to give up a good career that I had been with it, uh, for about 10 years. I had to give it up. I had to give up a couple other things, too, because I needed um, the Lord needed to work some things out of me. The Lord needed to make sure that the places that he was taking me in in the finance arena needed to be pure. And he needed to make sure that um, other things weren't going to interfere because, you know, either you serve God or you serve mammon. OK, let's be real. That's what the Bible says. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve them both. You have to serve one or the other. You're going to either love one or hate the other, Scripture tells us. So people spend a lot of hours per week 
working and that's great I'm, I, that's we should work we're called to work the bible tells us we should work six days a week and someone that doesn't work isn't even worthy of eating so i'm not against working i'm, I, I'm not against that i work i have multiple businesses i'm not against working getting ready to establish another business and another one because that's what god's calling us to do <laughs> that's another thing but um but I, i'm i'm saying this to share with you guys that you're called into certain valleys to be stripped of certain things, okay? And the stripping process has to take place. And the stripping process is not pretty, it doesn't feel good, and oftentimes it's public, okay? Public meaning people around you are gonna see you going through this valley, okay? Because what's being tested and what's, what's happening is the very promises of God that he has spoken to you are now being tested. And sometimes they're tested publicly, as the valley I was just talking about in finances. I was tested publicly in this, real publicly in it, okay? That's all I'm going to say is real publicly in it, okay? And that was okay. I had a lot of people that didn't understand why I was making the moves I was making, you know, for whatever reason. I could care less. I'm walking with God. God said, go here. God said, do this. God said, Regina, you're not allowed to work anymore. I need you to be at home with me. Okay. All right, Lord, I don't know how we're going to pay the bills, but okay, if that's what you want, I'll do it. And you know what? I did it. And in that, I had to learn to trust him. I had to learn to lay everything down. Sometimes we go through valleys so we can lay the things down in our life that are idols, things that have our heart and we're not even aware of it. Okay. I'm not talking about an, an idol that you bow down and worship, but I'm talking about an, an idol that controls what you do and where you go and what you're willing to say and how far, how extreme you're willing to live for Christ Jesus. Okay, money can be an idol. It is an idol. It is an idol to a lot of people, okay? It really is, but the truth is the same thing. I'm going to tell you guys the same thing I tell my husband. If he's watching, he's going to get mad. <laughs> but um, the truth is it's all going to burn in the end. Who cares if you're in a $2 million house or in a $1 million house or a $500,000 house? Who cares? It will make no difference at the end of the day. It won't matter because it's going to burn. Okay, so why everything? Why would I have all my intentions and everything that I do be focused on money? Why would I do that? Because money can't get me salvation. Money's not going to buy me a relationship with Jesus Christ. Money isn't going to buy me intimacy with him. Money's not going to buy me intimacy with the Father. Money's not going to buy me tools for the kingdom. Money's not going to buy me strategies that come from the throne room of God. Money's not going to buy me any of those things. Money, money will buy things that are needed, and it's a good tool to have, and yes, it's needed, and we need it to do, um, do business, but... Come on now, we need to get real about stuff. And I'm sharing that with somebody because you might be tested in this area. You might be tested in the area of finances now. You might be tested in it. You might be in a valley of finances, figuring out what you're gonna do. Are you gonna do what the Lord said? Or are you gonna cave in because you're getting pressure from your spouse or your kids? Oh yeah, I've been there. I had my husband looking at me like I was crazy. Regina, what are you doing? What do you mean you're not working? The Lord won't allow me to work right now. This was, I don't know how many years ago. This was, ooh, I don't know, maybe seven years ago. This was a long time ago, but there was a period where the Lord would just not allow me to work. I had job offers coming in. I'm sorry, I can't work. No, I can't work with you. No, why? I mean, you know, you can't really explain that to people. <laughs> the Lord doesn't want me to work. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and I know he doesn't call a lot of people to do that. My point in sharing that with you is to say that the Lord may be calling you to a place of obedience in something, and you're going to have to make the decision. Are you going to follow the Lord, or are you going to cave in? Are you going to cave in? Okay, so some of our valleys are about that. Are you going to cave in? Are you going to be concerned what it looks like? Are you going to be concerned what they say about you? Are you going to be concerned if your credit score changes? I mean, come on, some of us idolize our credit score. Yeah, some of us, I said it, some of you idolize your credit score, okay? And it's God that gives you the power to get wealth, not your credit score. You may get a better interest rate. I get it. Good business sense. I get it. I'm there. I get it. But some of you idolize it. You idolize it. You think your credit score is your source? 
It's not. The Lord God is your source. So, yeah. Okay. I think I just lost like five people. But anyway, I'm going to be real with you guys. You know, I'm going to be real about things because that's kind of who I am. And, you know, this is stuff that we face. Okay, so we just talked about um, asking the Lord why you're in the valley and what you need to learn. This is really important to get from him because if you don't know why you're in the valley, you're not going to know what's happening in the valley. So it's going to be a lot harder for you to navigate through because you don't know the why, why you're there. That was the whole point of me telling you about uh, the stripping that went on in my valley with the finances. I knew what it was. I knew the Lord was saying, Regina, I have you. I've called you to kingdom financing. So we're going to lay all this other stuff down you've been depending on. All this other stuff you built, are you willing to let it crumble because you trust me? And I was, I was willing. I was willing because I, I already knew what the Lord was calling me to. I, kn I knew what he wanted. I knew what he wanted. I heard his voice. I already knew. I knew that I knew. I knew that I knew that I knew. I knew what he wanted. So it, it came to the point that I had to make a determination. Regina, you said you know it, but are you going to live it out? Are you now going to walk it out in that valley in front of people with people looking at you like you're crazy? Are you going to do it? So it's really important to know why you're in the valley, okay, and what you need to learn from it. Because if you get that, I'm telling you, if you get that one piece right there, your valley is going to become a lot easier, okay, because your attitude is going to change. You're going to get understanding. If you get that piece, that's, that's major right there. Okay, so the next item for your strategic battle plan is praise and worship. Sorry about that. Okay. So the next item in your um, in your strategic battle plan is praise, worship, and thanksgiving. Okay. This is essential as well. It will always be part of your battle plan. Why? Because thanksgiving in a tough place is a weapon for battle. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In all things give thanks, for this is the will of Christ Jesus concerning you. Okay, so you have to give thanks in all things. In your valley, you have to learn how to give thanks. You have to learn how to lift your hands and give thanks and give praise when you don't feel good and when everything around you looks bad and when everything looks like it's crumbling. Oh, man, there's some real power in being able to lift up your hands and just praise and worship the Lord. That is a, I'm telling you, that is a strategy. That is a weapon of battle in the valley to be able to give thanksgiving to be able to give worship and praise, man, it's a sacrifice because it costs you something. Number one, your flesh doesn't want to worship the Lord God anyway, right? So when you tell your flesh, no matter what it feels like, we're going to worship the Lord today, oh, it costs something. It costs something out of your, your flesh. And the Lord responds to that because the Lord says, no matter what, no matter what I do, no matter what's happening, she's still going to praise me. She still has praise in her mouth for me. She still has reverence for me. So we have to learn how to give thanks in our valley. And sometimes that's really hard when we're overwhelmed by emotions and feelings and, and that type of thing. Sometimes giving thanks can be real hard. But I want to encourage you to, if you're not already giving thanks in your valley, to make it a point to give thanks to the Lord. I'm not talking about when you go to church. I'm talking about behind closed doors. Okay? Because I'm not talking about what we do in church. This is about you and God behind closed doors. Okay. This is the valley is behind closed doors. Okay. <laughs> it's with you. We wake up in the morning. It's with you when you go to sleep at night. Okay. It's with you when you go to brush your teeth in the morning. It's there when you make lunch, the valley is with you and it's behind closed doors. So that's what we're talking about. So make sure that you're giving praise, worship, and thanksgiving, okay? Because that's the will of that's the will of Christ Jesus concerning you. So, okay, great. All right. So the next um, essential item in the battle plan is to use the word of God. Okay. We know the word of God is a sharp tool, right? It's very sharp. The written word of God, the Bible, you need to find scriptures to stand on and renew your mind with. OK, you need to make sure you're not giving any place to your flesh to rule in your valley. You need to get to a place where you're decreeing the word, where you're saying it out loud. It is written. Right. Scripture says, have I not commanded you to be strong and of a good courage? That's Joshua 1, 9. It tells us, have I not commanded you? That means it's not an option. It's not an option for me to be strong and of a good 
courage. It's a command from the Lord to be strong and of a good courage. Okay, that means I got to put my feelings to the side. Too many of us operate in our feelings. Our feelings are master deceivers, okay? One day it's up and one day it's down and the next day it feels this way and our feelings tell us whether we're going to worship and our feelings tell us whether we're going to love our spouse and our feelings tell us if we're going to tolerate our children and our feelings tell us, you know, if we're going to like this person, if we're going to do this, all this stuff, all these feelings. We need to get out of operating in our feelings. Our feelings have way too much uh, control over what we do and what we don't do. And when we learn how to make those our feelings and emotions subject to our spirit, we will rule and reign in every arena, arena that we're in, every place that our foot treads, we're going to rule and reign because emotions are not an issue. Okay? I, one day I'm going to teach about emotions. I'm going to teach about how emotions are master deceivers. The Lord has really showed me some things about emotions, and one day I'm going to share it. So... Okay, so we're at the place that we're talking about. You're using the word of God. You're using scripture as the sharp tool, okay? You're finding scriptures. Maybe they're scriptures that the Lord's already talked to you about, okay? Maybe they're your favorite scriptures. Maybe it's the scriptures you use time and time again. Maybe you need to go look for some different scriptures to use. Maybe you need to do a subject on, a, a search subject and study on whatever, whatever it is you're facing in the valley, OK, if you're dealing with somebody difficult in the valley, let's say, you know, some of our valleys have to do with other people. It's not just me facing something in the valley. Sometimes we're in the valley because of someone that we love. Right. Maybe we're in the valley because our spouse is acting up. Maybe we're in the valley because our children are acting up or, you know, the, our mother or sister that lives with us is acting up. Or maybe, heaven forbid, maybe they got an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction, okay? And you're in the valley of this thing because it's in your home and it's in your family. And you can't do anything about it because you're dealing with someone else that has free will and makes decisions on what they're going to do. Some of us are in those valleys, okay? So we have to go to the Word of God. We have to be strong. We have to be courageous, you know? And we have to endure these things well like good soldiers. And I'm, I'm going to talk about valleys that... Um, that include other people. So if I don't go back to it, somebody remind me when we get to the question purpose to talk about the valleys that um, involve other people because that that is a um, that's a that's a that's a tough that's a tough valley. It's tough. It's tough. In fact, that type of valley is why I had to create <laughs> this strategic battle plan. I had to <laughs> create a battle plan that was gonna that I knew you know, that I knew was going to get me through. I had to know I was going to make it through this thing. Regardless of what this person does or doesn't do, I had to know I was going to make it through. So there's things that I had to do. I got tired of being tossed back and forth. I got tired of feeling like I didn't have anything left, left to give. I got tired of throwing my hands up. I got tired of praying for the same things over and over again every day, praying that this person would change, praying that God would intervene, praying for all these things, which is Great. I'm not saying prayer isn't great, but I'm saying it was time to get strategic. So I know those type of valleys really well. The valleys that have a loved, a loved one in it, the ones that, you know, that you have to learn how to love through their stuff, love through their mess, love the unlovable, loving the spouse that wants to leave you. Come on now. Come on. I'm talking to, I'm talking to somebody. Le loving the spouse who wants to leave you. Come on, loving the spouse that has threatened to walk out. Come on, you got to learn how to love. You got to love them even when they don't love you. That's what Jesus did. He, you know, he didn't worry about whether love was going to get uh, given back to him before he gave it. He loved. He loved. He loved and he gave freely. And he gave us the best example of how to deal with difficult people. Love them. Love is patient. Love is kind. You know, love is love is long suffering. Love keeps no right of wrong. Some of us are in valleys with other people, so we can simply learn how to love them where they are. You know, love is not conditional. It's unconditional. So, yeah. Okay. So that's where we are with that. 
So I hope you guys are getting something good out of this. I hope that that the Lord is speaking to you as I'm talking. I, I'm really, I really believe and pray that revelation is going to come to you guys as you meditate on this and that the Lord's going to show you exactly what you need. You may not need all these pieces, but he's going to show you what you need. He really is. So the next item that is essential in your battle plan is learning how to command your valley. What does that mean? That means you're going to tell your valley what it's going to do for you. That means you may have to make daily confessions regarding your valley, okay? It means that you're going to have to speak to it, that you're going to have to call those things that are not as if they were, okay? Because we know the power of life and death is in the tongue and that you're going to eat the fruit of your lips. So you need to start commanding your valley on a daily basis, which is partly why I want you to write your battle plan down because you're going to write down things. You're going to command your valley. Let's say just for the sake of, we're going to talk about marriage just because that's kind of what we've been talking about a little bit. So how would I deal with a difficult marriage? How would I deal with the spouse that's getting ready to leave me, <laughs> you know, or <laughs> not, you know, maybe my spouse doesn't love me anymore. Maybe, you know, maybe my spouse is, you know, out with someone else right now. Um, you know, whatever the case is, you know, how, how do I command my valley? to work for me? How do I tell the valley what it's going to do for me? I'm going to start speaking to it, right? Because scripture tells us if you decree a thing, it's going to be established. So you're going to speak to the valley. You're going to say, you know, you know, your marriage, your valley, whatever you put in that place, you're going to be a well-watered place for me. Okay. Valley, you're going to conform me into the image of Christ. What are we doing? We're coming in agreement with scripture, and now we're telling this valley what it's going to do for us. We're making this valley line up to conform us into the image of God because that's what it's designed to do. Okay? You can decree, I'm strong in the valley. I cherish the valley. Because how many of you love the valley? Nobody loves the valley. We don't like the valley. <laughs> the valley's bad. The valley hurts, right? The valley, there's a lot going on in the valley. Like there's disappointment in the valley. There's all types of stuff. There's fear in the valley. There's all types of stuff. But um, but the valley, you know, can also be a place that you cherish. It can be a well-watered place. You just have to change your view of it. This thing is here to do me good. I'm going to get well-equipped in this valley, you know, and just start commanding it. Lord, I thank you that this valley is here to make me. I cooperate with it, Lord God. I thank you that I see everything I need in this valley. Nothing is hidden to me anymore. Everything that is uh, was um, hidden is now visible to me. I thank you that I got understanding in this valley, that this valley is going to make me stronger, that day by day this valley is going to cause me to ascend into the high places, that the Lord's going to you know, conform my, conform my character in this valley. I, Lord, I thank you. I won't never have to see this valley again because I'm going to get everything I need to get out of it, okay? If you get everything you need to get out the valley, you won't see that valley again. We tend to see the same valleys over and over when we fail to get what we need out of it, when we fail to be conformed into the image of Christ, when we fail to realize why we're there and what needs to change in us. Because if you think the valley is about the other person, oh, yeah, I'm going to go back to that. Those of you having marriage issues, if you think or, or, or issues with someone else in the valley, you know, we talked about the other person causing the valley. If you think that valley is about the person, it's really not. It's really about you and them. It's not just about them, okay? It's about you being conformed into the image of Christ. It really is about you. That's why you're there. You're there to intercede for that person. You're there to stand in the gap. You're there to contend for them. They may have lost their mind for a moment. They may, you know, think about it. If there's a spouse out there that is, you know, messing around or thinking about leaving, they have, you know, you have lost your mind for a minute. We got to contend for these things. If we have family members that are in alcohol or drug addiction, man, we got to contend for these things. It's real easy for us to get so frustrated and throw our hands up and say, I'm done. But I'm telling you, that's not God's will. God wants you to contend for them. He wants you to pray for them. And he wants you to love them at the same time. And he doesn't want you to give up on them. And he doesn't want you to give up on the promises that he made you. The, every word that he's spoken to you, he doesn't want you to give up on. So, okay. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so we talked about commanding your valley. If you guys have any questions about what that looks like, you can let me know at the end or you can shoot me an inbox message. But 
<clears throat> commanding your valley is basically the same thing as commanding your day, if you've ever heard of that. You know, you get up in the morning and say, oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. And you're setting the tone of the day. Same thing with your valley. You're setting the tone for your valley. The valley used to be hard. It used to be dark. It used to be, you know, something that you dreaded waking up to. But now you're going to change the, 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 the your tune in it. You're going to you're going to say, valley, I love you. I love you, valley. Thank you that I'm in this valley. Lord, thank you for this valley. Give thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you that I'm in this thing. Thank you that you trust me to go through it. Thank you that you're making me and shaping me in it. And you start doing that and it just changes your whole perception about your valley. Okay. Here is another important um, aspect of the battle plan. Okay. You need to go back and revisit any prophetic words that the Lord has spoken over your life or any prophetic words that you received. For you prophetic people, that's real easy. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> For people that have no clue what I'm talking about, <laughs> about the prophetic, I'm talking about words that you know the Lord has spoken about your life. I'm talking about times that you were in prayer with somebody and certain scriptures kept coming back up. I'm talking about any, any time you were, you know, uh, around the things of God and you hear somebody say, God wants to do this. God wants to do that. You know, I hear God saying, those are all prophetic words. You need to go back and revisit your prophetic words and what the Lord has told you, you know, about the situation. Because if you do that, you can draw strength from it. Okay, not only that, you're standing on the word that he gave you. Okay, because really that's, you know, that's what's being tested. If the Lord said you're going to have a great marriage, you know, or you're going to, you know, you're going to be a, uh, you know, a, a shoe business owner you know, and now all heck breaks loose in your shoe business or the building of your shoe business or the building of your marriage or your marriage being sustained, you need to go back to those prophetic words and you need to draw strength from them, okay? The Lord gave me a visual of what it's like, what it looks like to stand on a prophetic word. It's like climbing a mountain. It's like climbing out the valley, climbing uphill. And every time you decree that word. Every time you say, Lord, you said, Lord, you said I was going to be a shoe business owner. Lord, you said my marriage was going to be great. You said, Lord, that, you know, you were going to use us in ministry together. You said X, Y, Z, whatever he said. Anytime you do that, it's like taking, you know, those little spikes that are on your shoes when you're climbing a mountain. I never climbed a mountain, but I have seen it on TV before. <laughs> but this was the image that the Lord gave me is that every time you, um, every time that you would, you know, decide that I'm going to stand on this word, it's like anchoring yourself on the side of this mountain that you're climbing. Okay. You're going uphill. So you got to anchor yourself. You may not, you may not move at a fast pace, but you're not falling behind either. You're not slipping down the side of the mountain because you're anchored by that word. Lord, you said, I can't tell you how many times I said, Lord, you said, or it is written, Lord, you said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out the mouth of God. Lord, you said, if I train a child up in the way that he should go when he's older, he will not depart. Lord, you said what God has put together, let no man part. You know, you're standing on the word of God and you're standing on any prophetic word that the Lord has given you. Lord, you said, da, da, da. You fill in the blank. Lord, you said it. And here goes another tip. You need to say it out loud. You can't fight a thought with a thought, okay? You have to fight thoughts and you have to fight dissensions and, and thoughts and emotions. You have to say it out loud with your mouth. Why? Because, you know, in the beginning, God said, let there be life. He could have just, he could have just thought, let there be light and it would have happened, but he didn't. He spoke it. He spoke it because he gave us an example of what he wants to wants us to do. He wants us to speak to those things. He wants us to declare his prophetic word. He wants us to give that prophetic word back to him because, you know, he watches, watches over his word to perform it. So, Lord, you said, you said, Lord, I don't know how this is going to get done, but your word says that you perfect the things that concern me. 
So just give, give the word back to him. Stand on that prophetic word that he's shown you. You fight with that prophetic word. That prophetic word is a tool in your hand. You fight with it. You draw strength from it, and it will help you in the valley. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to try to get ready to finish up because I've been on here for a little while. Okay, so the next item is um, we talked about going back and revisiting the prophetic word to draw strength from it. Next item is to recognize the acts of the flesh in your life, okay? The acts and works of the flesh are the things that, you know, war with the spirit. What are you doing opposite of what you should be doing in the spirit? How is your flesh talking to you? What suggestion is it making to you, right? What suggestion is it making to you that contradicts the, the way of God? You know, we were kind of talking about marriage, so I'm just going to kind of stay there because I think everyone, instead of changing examples, I think everyone can probably relate to it because they're probably married or they've been in a relationship and they understand the, you know, relational things. So I'm going to stay right there. But, you know, what suggestions is your flesh making to you? Is it telling you, man, you should leave this person? What is it saying to you? You know, is it causing, you know, Galatians 5, 19 talks about all the works of the flesh. It talks about all the works of the flesh. If you're doing any of these things, you need to recognize what you're doing. If you have fits of anger, jealousy, strife, if there's contention or competition, dissensions, divisions, come on, man, this is all works of the flesh. So you need to recognize any acts of the flesh that are in operation of your, in your life. And if you recognize them, you need to repent for them. If you see them, you need to repent and you need to stop doing them. Okay? That's just, that's just real. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. But you need to recognize how your flesh is, is responding to the difficult situation. Okay? Okay, the next item is to fast. Okay, put your flesh under subjection, buffet it, keep your spirit stronger than your soul and feelings. As I said earlier, feelings are a master deceiver. So you need to fast. That will definitely help you through any, um, any valley because it causes your spiritual ears to be open. It causes you to become closer and you're putting your feelings and your emotions subject to, this, to your spirit. So fasting is always a great tool for a valley. Okay, and I do have one optional item I want to share with you before we talk quickly about just a couple other little things, and I'm going to take your questions. So if you guys have questions, you can start to get ready to put them up, and I'm happy to answer them. So uh, the other item that you might want to consider in your battle plan is to ask the Lord if you need to get a prayer partner or a partner with somebody specifically for this valley. This would be a person that you can confide in be transparent in, someone that can be in agreement with you. This is someone that needs to be strong in the spirit. This is someone that needs to not be in a valley themselves, honestly. You know, this is someone that, you know, you need, need to be able to go to. You can just ask the Lord, Lord, is there any anyone that you would want me to partner with? You know, because scripture tells us one can put a thousand to flight and two can put 10,000 to flight. So, um, and we know that there's power in agreement, right? Jesus said, if any, any of you two agree on anything, that it shall be done. So there's power in agreement. And we know that's according to the will of God, not just anything that you agree on. We know that that's according to the will of God. But a, part, a prayer partner might be a good idea for some people. So that's something for you to ask the Lord about. Um, you want to be careful who you just let in your valley. You don't want to just let anyone in because it's already a difficult place. So you really want to be led when you do that. You really want to make sure. That is somebody that is trustworthy and somebody that's not going to tell your business and really someone that's going to really contend before the Lord along uh, beside you in prayer. So that's a great optional item. And then basically anything else the Lord tells you. He may show you many other things. He may, you know, teach you some other things. You may already been thinking about, oh, this or that. Add it to your list. Again, it's your personalized strategic battle plan so that you can make it through this valley with everything that you're supposed to make it through so you can come out refined 
you can come out without impurities, that you can come out stronger, that you can come out shining like a diamond, that you can come out knowing that you're above and not beneath, knowing that you overcome by the blood and the word of your testimony. So, um, okay, one other thing I kind of wanted to share with you, two things, I want to talk about shame. I want to talk about how shame sometimes can keep us in a place of not sharing with anyone why we're, why we're in the valley. Sometimes we're ashamed of being in the valley. We think that we did something wrong. We might think that the Lord doesn't love us. We might think that, you know, God is just really too busy to be concerned about me. We may, uh, may start to experience some shame. Shame is always from the enemy. Shame always wants to make you feel like, you know, God's not going to come through for you. And the problem with shame is, is if you're dealing with shame, it, you may also may be dealing with some pride. You know, I don't want people to see me in this valley. I don't want, I don't want people to know what I'm going through. And there is some wisdom in not sharing things with everyone, but you at least should have somebody that you can share things with. And if you're concerned about what other people are going to think about you, that's pride. Okay, and maybe, you know, pride is an area that the Lord wants to deal with you in your valley. So that is shame. Um, also, shame happens even when we deal with our kids or dealing with the, the other person I was talking about. When we're in the valley because of a family member, a spouse, a child, not of our own actions. And it's not about us. It's about someone else that we have to go through this valley with. Sometimes shame you know, shame can pop up because sometimes you're dealing with things maybe other people haven't dealt with. Maybe it's not a valley you can share with someone. Maybe you've already talked about it with everyone and nobody seems to get it. It's okay. Don't let shame come upon you. You know, scripture tells us that we will not be put to shame. If we're believers in Christ. Scripture already tells us we shall not be put to shame. God's not going to disgrace you. Okay. The valley is there to make you and not break you. The other thing I want to talk about is disappointment. That's kind of where I even started this whole nugget of what I'm teaching about is how to handle disappointment. But disappointment is one of those things that um, you got to be real with. You know, oftentimes we're disappointed in people. Sometimes we're disappointed that we're even in the valley. Sometimes we're disappointed in God that he would allow us to go through the valley. I'm just going to be real with you. You know, I know that these are things that we talk about. We don't talk about being disappointed in God. But the truth is, sometimes we are disappointed in God. Not because he's a disappointing God. Not because he disappoints us. We know that he's loving, kind. He, he, uh, he withholds us with his mighty right hand. It's not that he disappoints us. But we are disappointed that we had to go through this thing. And you have to be careful with disappointment because disappointment will be one of those things that causes you to um, back up on your intimacy with Christ. Okay, and that just makes your valley even longer. It makes it even harder. You know, your goal is to get out the valley as, as soon as possible. I think everyone would probably agree with me on that. I want to get out the valley as soon as possible. So it's important to um, to recognize disappointment. It's important to um, not just recognize it, but repent for it. And if you've been disappointed, you need to um, you need to repent for it. You need to be real about it. If you've been disappointed in God, you need to tell Him, Lord, I, Father, I've been disappointed. I'm disappointed that I even went through this. I'm disappointed that my journey has led me here. I'm disappointed that this this valley has been so long. I'm disappointed that I, I'm going through this. You need to you need to acknowledge it and you need to repent for it, and you need to understand that um, God's not withholding anything from you. He's not trying to make your journey harder or longer. You don't have to prove anything to him. You can't earn his love. <laughs> You can't earn it. You don't have to prove anything to him. 
And God wants you to be very real with him. When you're in your prayer time during the valley seasons, be really real with God. If your heart is hurting, tell him, Lord, I'm hurting. I don't even know what to say. Father, I'm hurting so much. Lord, all I can do is cry, Lord God. All I can do is, you know, um, whatever it is, be real with him. He already knows. He already knows and he wants you to pour it out on him. Scripture tells us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. So it's okay to be in that intimate place with him and you're just pouring out everything on him. You know, pouring out the disappointment. Lord, I'm disappointed. Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand, Lord God. Everything that I'm seeing is contrary to what you said. I don't understand. It's okay to do that because you're going to get understanding. Those things are going to be proven. The word of God is not going to fail you. God is not going to fail you. So it's important to recognize disappointment, especially disappointment, especially disappointment. You know, if you have disappointment towards God or you've been disappointed in ministry or you've been disappointed with the pastor, the way a pastor has treated you, the way someone in the ministry has treated you, the way your brother or sister in Christ has treated you. If you're disappointed in your spouse, if you're disappointed in your children, if you're disappointed in yourself, it's really important to, to, to deal with disappointment. It's really important. And I really pray that, you know, the Lord will show you how to deal with it. You know, he'll show you how to deal with disappointment. You know, um, the funny thing about disappointment is when I went to go look up the word disappointment, it really means, it means to break. It means to asunder or divide. It means to cause to cease. It means to defeat or dissolve. It means to make of no effect. It means to come to nothing. And it means to utterly make void. That is the definition of disappointment. Now, all that sounds negative, right? But it's not negative at all. It's actually positive because the breaking happens in the valley. Your will is broken. You realize how weak you really are. You realize just how much you need him. You realize how everything can change overnight. You realize how the balance of someone's life is, is weighing, you know, is weighing in this thing. You realize, you know, a breaking happens. It's a good breaking. In fact, if you look up the word break, it, it, uh, look up the word disappointed, it translates to break. And it's used throughout the Old Testament scripture. And it's, it first shows up when the Lord is talking about um, his covenant in Genesis 17. This is the first breaking that we see God cutting off, cutting off the uncircumcised people for his people. So breaking is a good thing. The breaking is a good thing. To be disappointed is real, actually really a good thing because it allows you to see where your trust is, what your hope has been in. And not only that, if you're disappointed in someone, thank you, Holy Spirit, if you're disappointed in someone, you're probably expecting something from them. If you're expecting something from them, you're not really loving them because love doesn't uh, do things to get accolades and love doesn't do anything expecting anything in return. True love, pure love does not expect anything in return. So if you're disappointed in someone because they didn't return what was deserved to you, whether it be love or, you know, um, whatever, whatever the case is, you know, if you didn't do that, then, you know, you're disappointed because somebody didn't reciprocate what they should have. But did you do it because you expected something in return? Even with God, when you worship him and you adore him and you, you live for him, are you expecting something in return? I think it's healthy to expect something in return. Okay, I really do. I think it's unhealthy to have a picture laid out of how things are going to look. And when it doesn't happen that way, you become disappointed in God. Because this is what we do. God shows us, we're talking about disappointment. God shows us a small piece of a thing. He gives us a word or tells us something or unveils something to us. And we have that one little piece 
And now all of a sudden, we draw this long, big conclusion. We know exactly what this thing is going to look like. We know exactly how it's going to unfold. Our mind starts to build this thing out. All we have is this little nugget, but our mind is building these things out, telling us how it's going to go. We're wanting things to go a certain way, and when it doesn't, we're disappointed. Okay, and then when we're disappointed, who do we blame? We blame God. And that's just real. That's just real. There's a lot of people walking around not knowing that they're disappointed in God, and they need to be delivered from it. They need to be healed from it. There's an inner healing that needs to, 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 um, to happen regarding it. You need to, you need to repent for it. You, know, you need to repent for it, right? I mean, think about Peter. I thought about Peter when I was writing out this whole thing that I was going to share. I thought about Peter. Think about how disappointed Peter was. Peter was in the garden when Jesus was being arrested. How did Peter respond? Peter pulled out his sword and cut off someone's ear. There was an act of the, of the flesh. There were some works of the flesh, <laughs> okay? That must have been some type of anger to pull out a sword and cut off someone's ear. But why was he disappointed? He was disappointed because the whole vision that he had in his head didn't play out. It wasn't playing out the way he thought it was going to play out. Okay? And here's what I've learned walking with God. It never plays out the way you think it's going to play out. It's always important to know that you have just a piece of it. And no matter how you think it's going to manifest, no matter how you think it's going to come to pass, it's going to come to pass differently, okay, because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, okay? He knows the plans that he has for you, plans of good and not evil, plan to give, plans to give you hope and an expected end, okay? God just, the Lord just gives us a piece of it, and we need to be fluid in that piece. We need to say, Lord, I know you said this, however you do it, I'm okay with it. It doesn't have to look like this or that, and when we think it has to look like this and that, that's when the dis that's when disappointment comes in and we start to blame God or we start to blame somebody else. So that's what I have to say regarding disappointment. Um, I will take any questions if anyone has any questions. I'm going to see if anyone has any questions. And if not, I am going to get ready to just get off of here. So, do, do. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Let me see if I can go back and read the comments. Yep. Okay. Do, do. Thank you for sharing. If you haven't shared the video already, please share it. I know it's a long video, but, um, you know, God's heart is that his people have tools for the kingdom. He wants us to have tools to walk with him. And the strategic battle plan in the valley is a tool to walk with him. So I pray that it blesses you. I pray that the Lord has spoken to you during this time. Okay, I'm just seeing if anyone had any questions. Yeah. So, so I hope that you guys uh, got something out of this. I'm just going to... Uh, just ask that you share it with, with some people. Share it on your timeline because we're always facing valleys. Um, you don't always face valleys. There's seasons that you have valleys, and then there's you know seasons where, thank God, the valleys end because you made, into the, you made it into that good place. The promised land, flowing, flowing with milk and honey, you made it through the, all the refining, and there's still more, more refining that goes on, but... You made it through the refining time. You made it through the tough time. You made it through, you know, the the process of having things purged from you. So, yes. Okay. Thank you, Anika. I'm glad that it um, that it ministered to you. Amen. So, if no one has any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and get off here. If you have questions, you can always inbox me. But um, I pray that it blessed you, and I pray that the Lord will speak to you. I know He will. I know the Lord's going to reveal things to you and um, make sure as the Lord reveals things to you, share it with somebody, share it with someone. I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring it back to your remembrance, any items. Maybe you're going to meet someone tomorrow that you're going to have to give one item from this list to. OK, so um, I believe, you know, the Lord wants us to be equipped. He's about equipping his people 
and he wants us to be equipped and he's supplying us the tools for the equipping. So bless you guys. Thanks for watching and have a great night.